Hello and welcome to today's seminar. I would like to remind you that we are taking questions in Slido. You can see the link in the YouTube chat. Don't forget to give your full name and that you can upvote questions. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Jeremy Gibbons from Oxford University. Take it away, Jeremy. Thank you, Mary. So, hello, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be talking in this series as well. It's been a great series. And thank you to uh, John, Mary and Kuhn for hosting us um, when we can't get together in person. I'm going to talk about uh, algorithm design with Haskell, uh, as the title says. And this is a talk in four parts. Um, I'm going to say a bit about functional programming, which is, I don't need to say much for this audience, but uh, um, this is, I'm talking about uh, our new book, uh, Algorithm Design with Haskell, um, actually physically exists now uh, with Richard Bird and myself, uh, and it uses functional programming for uh, algorithm design. And uh, I guess I'll say a bit about why we think functional programming is good for teaching, uh, presenting algorithm design. And I'll show some simple examples around greedy algorithms, which are a core part of uh, algorithm design. And then I want to talk about two novelties in the book. So, so two things that are non-standard in the book. One is, um, turns out that for the kinds of algorithms we want to talk about, we need to say a bit about non-determinism. So we need to step a bit beyond ordinary functional programming. And I'll explain why and how. And the other novelty is uh, an algorithm design technique called thinning, which uh, Richard has written about before with um, Uke de Moore in the Algebra Programming book. Uh, we think this is underappreciated and there's a big part of the book, a whole part literally of the book on thinning. And I want to say something about that. So um, why functional programming? Um, the thing with functional programming is that uh, programs are, are, are values, not commands. And that means you can reason with uh, your programs just like you can with, uh, with any expression. It's a good old fashioned equational reasoning um, is sufficient for proving things about your program. Uh, you don't have to step sideways from your programming language into predicate calculus and do some reasoning in the predicate calculus and then back into the programming language again in order to work out what you've concluded. The program texts are themselves amenable to equational reasoning. And uh, this is uh, much more straightforward, much simpler, uh, much more direct uh, and much more fun. So uh, we like calculating with functional programs. Um, so the, particularly for algorithm design, the way this works out is uh, you start off um, the, the description of your problem is, is already an implementation, um, but uh, as clear as possible without any regard to efficiency. Um, so it's, it might be hopelessly inefficient, but then you use good old fashioned equational reasoning to transform it into an equivalent program that is, uh, is, is acceptably efficient. So ideally one that has um, optimal asymptotic complexity um, as good as any imperative program. So that's the, the, the premise for the book. It's really algorithm design using a functional programming. We use Haskell as the vehicle because we like Haskell, but there's not much that's uh, essential to Haskell. Um, and uh, I see the book as a kind of a plea for simplicity in Haskell. So we don't use any fancy features. We don't use GADTs. We don't use monads. We don't use traversables. We do use type classes, but only standard ones. We don't introduce any fancy ones. Um, and so much of, most of what we do uh, will work perfectly well in any functional language. We don't even make any essential use of laziness, so it'll work fine in uh, OCaml and F-sharp and languages like that. So it's really algorithm design using functional programming. Um, the kind of equational reasoning I have in mind is, uh, is this fusion law of the fold R. So this is the basic fact about the, the Haskell standard function fold R, which collapses a list down to a value. So for example, summing a list of numbers, uh, the empty list has sum zero and to sum a non-empty non list x cons x is you add the head to the sum of the tail. So this is the standard recursion pattern for lists. And uh, the fusion law for fold R states that uh, a following function H can be uh, fused with a fold R to make another fold R with different uh, um, arguments, F prime and E prime, provided 
you can push H through the, the arguments of the original fold up, right? And you can push H through the F and through the E, uh, in, as it says on the right hand side of the implication. So, for example, um, summing a list and then doubling the result, double after sum, uh, can be fused. So you compute the whole thing in a single pass. Uh, this is a fold starting with zero because double sum of the empty list is still zero. But instead of using addition, you use this function twice plus that uh, adds two, two times its left-hand argument to the right-hand argument. Uh, so double after sum is a fold R, fold R twice plus with zero, uh, because double promotes through addition and promotes through the zero uh, to satisfy the, the two premises of the fusion law. So this is a, the, the basic uh, reasoning rule about folds. And uh, it's an equivalence. Uh, so the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. And actually it's useful both ways. Um, uh, you might see the, uh, the left-hand side as, a, a, as more efficient than the right-hand side because the right-hand side does a multiplication for every element and the left-hand side just does one multiplication. Um, and this is uh, a transformation known as strength reduction. It's something that compilers do for loops in imperative programs. It's something that's been studied for 40 years or more. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's very obvious, it's very important, um, and it's, it's a, an instance of fusion. But fusion backwards, it's fission. You, you split the double out from the fold R twice plus zero. Uh, we're going to use it the other way around. We're both, most likely going to be, most commonly going to be pushing double into sum um, because uh, the kinds of problems we're writing uh, often lend themselves to a simple specification um, of the form generate some candidates, test to discard some of the candidates, and of the ones that survive the test, aggregate them in some way, maybe count them, but most typically find the, the best of them, the least cost of them. So for example, uh, minimum cost spanning tree problem is specified by generating all the trees in a graph uh, keeping only the ones that are spanning trees, so that span the whole graph, and then out of all the spanning trees, compute the one with the, the minimum cost. So the aggregation is typically a selection, like min with. Uh, the generation is often a structured uh, recursion combinator, like fold, sometimes until, uh, sometimes unfold. There are examples of all of these in the book. And they're, they're often generating combinatorial objects like permutations and segments and, uh, and so on. But then the, the name of the game is to uh, fuse the aggregate function, the test function with the generate function. So you don't generate all trees and then discard most of them. You more purposefully generate only the spanning trees. So we're going to be using fusion to push the aggregation and the test inside the generation. And it will be a, an efficiency improving transformation that way as well. Of course, the program on the slide for minimum cost spanning tree is hopelessly inefficient because there are, there are a huge number of trees to choose from. But with some intelligence and some uh, calculation, you can get uh, an efficient algorithm to generate only spanning trees and not all the junk. Only minimum cost spanning trees and not all the junk. So I'm going to, uh, the talk is in four parts, and I'm going to have a pause for questions after each part. Um, questions can be asked on Slido, as Mary says. Um, so I hope that's all clear. Um, and there is a question, why the lion on the front cover? <laughs> uh, this is an excellent question, um, nothing to do with functional programming. The answer to the question is that Richard likes big cats. Uh, and you might remember that his previous book, Thinking Functionally with Haskell, uh, all had a big cat on the front, a tiger in that case. So we're continuing the theme. There's no, there's no deeper message to lions, as far as I know, unless Richard's trying to pull a fast one on me. So moving on, um, I'm going to talk about greedy algorithms. Uh, so these are algorithms that select a single optimal candidate. Um, well, so the problems are selecting a single optimal candidate constructed from some components somehow. And um, so examples are, computing the, the most efficient encoding of uh, pref prefix free code for compressing a message, so Huffman coding. So here you generate that the components are symbols in the message with their weights, 
and the candidates that you construct are encoding trees. Uh, minimum cost spanning tree, the components of the edges in the graph, the candidates, the trees, paragraph formatting, the components of the words in the paragraph, and the candidates are those words grouped into lines. Maybe you want the least wasteful of those. Uh, so a greedy algorithm works for this class of problem by assembling the optimal candidate step by step from the components. So it considers each component in turn and grows a candidate. Um, but the important thing is it maintains a single partial candidate throughout. Um, so you might think of this as, uh, as uh, like uh, have the slogan, think globally, act locally. What you're wanting is a global optimal solution. Um, and you can get there just by making locally optimal steps. You just uh, extend the partial candidate that you've got by the next component in the best way possible for each component in turn. And when you're done magically, you have the, the global uh, optimum. So the algorithm you end up with is often very simple um, and uh, it's easy to see what it's doing, but it's much harder to see often why uh, what it does is the right thing. It's harder to see that it actually does solve the problem, that it actually does produce the optimal solution. And anyone who's studied algorithm design with proofs of the correctness of algorithms uh, will remember the difficulties in proving Huffman coding correct or minimum cost spanning trees correct. Uh, the, the proofs take considerable invention. Um, most algorithm design textbooks uh, with that in mind skip over the proofs or very lightly touch the proofs. Uh, but because we can calculate, uh, we can take the proofs seriously and we can construct a program that will be um, correct by construction. Uh, it will, um, uh, it, is, it is developed in such a way that can only be correct. So here's a, a generic um, greedy algorithm uh, for computing a minimum cost candidate from some components. MCC computes the minimum cost candidate and takes a list of components and gives you a candidate uh, and it's min with cost after candidates. Couldn't be simpler than that. Min with cost here takes a, a list of candidates and finds the, the one with minimal cost. Um, we assume it's a non-empty list, so we can use Haskell's folder R1. Uh, we use a, uh, a binary operator min by f that compares two values x and y on, on their f values. Um, and of course, there may be ties. There may be two elements to the list x and y that have the same cost f. Uh, and so it's not clear which min width should return. Here, min width is defined to return the, the leftmost of the minimal elements. So if the tie, if fx and fy are the same, so x and y have the same cost, you get x rather than y. So that's min width. Candidates constructs uh, the, the list, the non empty list, a finite non empty list of candidates. So from a list of components, you get a list of candidates. And this is done by a fold. Um, I, I say this is a generic greedy algorithm. Uh, it's the generic greedy algorithm where the generator is a fold. There are other generic greedy algorithms that generate using a, an, a, an unfold or using an until or using some other combination. Here we use a fold. We start off with a single um, sort of empty candidate, C0. Uh, so we start off with a singleton list of candidates that contains just C0. And then uh, there's a function extend that takes the next component and one of the candidates and extends that candidate by that component in all possible ways. And then the step function does that for all the current components. So it uses a concat and a map, extends each component in all possible ways and then unions together all the sets of sets. So let's see an example. Um, you can specify sorting as uh, uh, one of these in this form. So min with cost after candidates, uh, the candidates that you generate are strings, the components that you generate them from are characters out of the input string. The empty partial candidate is the empty string and uh, the candidates we're going to generate are permutations. So we're going to find the best permutation. And we do that uh, with the function extend that extends a permutation C, a candidate, with the next element x, the next component x, in all possible ways. And it does that by splitting the, the candidate in two and sticking x in the middle. So for example, extending 
the candidate BCD with the next component A gives you uh, all the ways of inserting A into BCD. And if you do that for all, permit for all, for all uh, partial candidates, then you'll generate all permutations. And what we want to do is um, find the one that minimizes the inversion count. Uh, so here the function IC computes the inversion count. Um, and it, it's computing all the pairs X, Y in the list in that order. So X is before Y in the list, but X is greater than Y. So it's counting the pairs of elements X, Y that are out of order. Um, so what can we do with that? Well, let's recall the fusion law. Uh, we can fuse H with a fold, uh, provided some conditions apply. So in our case, H is min with cost. That's the, uh, the aggregator. There's no test. Um, and the fold is the thing that generates the permutations. So the starting value E is the singleton consisting of C naught. And uh, the function F that extends a candidate, extends the set of candidates um, is the step function. Um, the fusion rule already tells you what E prime has to be. It's, it's H of E. So here min with cost of a singleton collection. So that of course the the best in the singleton collection is the early element of that collection. So E prime is C naught. And we have to find F prime. So let's call that, let's rename that to G step. That's the greedy step. And we have to find a greedy step, a function G step that makes the fusion condition, uh, that satisfies the fusion condition. So that's the equation at the, the bottom of the slide. Min with cost after step has to be pushed through the step and uh, what ends up, um, if we can make that work, is the, is the function g step we need for the greedy algorithm. So let's uh, calculate. Um, we start with min with cost of step, and we uh, calculate in a few steps uh, to indeed get, at the bottom of the slide, g step x min with cost c's, um, as required on the slide, on the previous slide. And the calculation is quite straightforward. So the first thing we do is, unpack the definition of step. It was a concatenate the map with extend. Now uh, there's the distributive law. So the distributive law says, um, if I have a collection of collections, excesses, a non-empty collection of non-empty collections, uh, I can union them all together and take the best, or I can take the best out of each sub-collection and then take the, uh, the best out of those bests. Um, you might think of this as a bookkeeping law. It's the law that, uh, for aggregations in general, allows you to uh, do bookkeeping in a ledger. You can add up the years um, transactions in a book by adding up the transactions on each page and then adding up the pages. And it works because the aggregation function is associative. Uh, so provided we can, uh, so the, the, the distributive law lets us push min with cost through the concat, so we get min with cost and map min with cost, and the maps fuse. So now we have um, the next line. So we and then we define uh, g step to be the thing that's been mapped min with cost after extend x. So by definition, we now have min with cost after map g step x, um, and the requirement is that this is equal to the thing we're heading for. Uh, so let's call this the greedy condition. Um, what we require is min with cost after map g step, step x is g step x after min with cost. So provided that greedy condition holds, that's the premise. Distributive law is something you can prove once and for all. This is a premise. The greedy algorithm only works if you can satisfy this greedy condition. But if you can, uh, then you get a greedy algorithm. Uh, you fuse the min with cost with the step so you don't need to generate all candidates and then take the best. Uh, you're generating only one and keeping the best as you go. So keeping the front runner as you go. So we've concluded that provided the greedy condition holds, the minimum cost candidate is uh, a fold R starting from the initial candidate C0 using this G-step function. And G-step extends are one candidate in all possible ways and then just takes the best of those. So you end up with one candidate again. So that was quite simple and a nice use of fusion um, and it leads you to the greedy condition. The greedy condition pops out of the calculation, no magic pulling rabbits from hats. 
Um, this is the condition under which the, uh, the greedy algorithm works. So let's try it. We had a greedy-ish problem sorting. Um, can you do it for sorting? And the problem is, no, you can't. Uh, for somewhat technical reasons, but let me try and unpack them. So here I've got lists, 7123 is a list, 3217 is a list, their permutations are the same list. Um, and uh, the superscripts there are the inversion counts. So 7123 has inversion count three. There are, uh, the seven is less than, is greater than one, seven is greater than two, seven is greater than three. So there are three inversions. And the greedy condition says uh, from the top left, um, you can uh, go across to the right. You, you can extend these permutations in all possible ways. Um, so this extending, sorry, extend each of these permutations with, uh, with the next element. In this case, the next element is six, the next component. And you, and you get the best extension in each case. So the best way of extending 7123 gives you 71236 with inversion count four. The best way of extending 3217 gives you 32167 with inversion count three. And the better of those is the second one. And that should be equal to going down the bottom, down the right, left hand side and across the bottom, taking the best out of the two that you started with and then extending that in the best way. Well, the two that we started with have the same inversion count, it's a tie. So remember, Linwith picks the leftmost uh, of the best. So you get 7123, you extend that and you get a different answer. So the greedy condition has failed. We, we don't have uh, the property we need. And the, in a nutshell, the problem is that the ordering, ordering by inversion count um, is not linear uh, because it's not uh, an anti-symmetric ordering that you can have two different permutations with the same inversion count. And that's quite common. Usually the thing you're trying to optimize doesn't completely determine the end result. You just, you just care that you have one of the best possible. So what can we do about that? Um, one thing we can do is to use a different fusion law called context sensitive fusion. Um, in fact, this problem that makes greedy sorting, the greedy condition fail for sorting never comes up in evaluating the greedy algorithm for sorting because you'll never find yourself in a situation with just 7123 and 3217. So you'll never be in this situation. The situations you'll find yourself in are with all permutations. And when you have all permutations of a, a list, there's a unique one that has the minimum inversion count, um, i.e. the sorted one. Um, and uh, so you don't have this problem of ties and, and the problem goes away in this case for sorting. So sometimes uh, a different fusion rule works. Another trick you can do, um, uh, one that fixes the problem at a stroke, Richard says, is to change the cost function from inversion count, IC, to the identity function, ID. So you just write one vertical bar, vertical line. Um, and well, of course, ID is uh, optimizing by ID is a linear ordering um, if two elements are the same under the ID function, then they're the same. Um, and what this gives you is, uh, nobody said the cost function has to be a number. Um, the cost function just has to give you things that are comparable and uh, sequences are comparable, sequences of integers are comparable. Uh, so what we get is in fact the, well, so it's the, the minimum sequence, so the, the lexically least sequence. Um, and sorting uh, to give you the lexically least sequence does indeed work. Uh, I think that's cheating and I'll explain why in the next section. Uh, so the third thing you can do, uh, which is what the next section is about, is this is where non-determinism comes in. The problem was we had to break a tie early um, and we shouldn't break ties earlier than we need to. Uh, we should keep all the optimal candidates. So we should keep both in this case, 7123 and 3217. So greedy, the greedy calculation looked very nice, went through no problem, but um, uh, it didn't work here. Here's a, another application. Um, then I see there's some questions to answer. Uh, the 
making change. So here's UK currency, uh, the coins have denominations 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, and 200. And uh, the smallest currency, smallest denomination is one, which means we can make up any integer, any natural number sum. Uh, we want to find the, the best tuple, where a tuple is um, a handful of change. Uh, so it's a, a count for each denomination of coins, how many pennies you've got, how many two p's, how many fives, and so on. So what we want to minimize is the total number of coins, which is the sum of the tuple, the sum of all the counts of the tuple. And it's another optimization problem. So it's min with count uh, after tuples. And I'm not going to explain how tuples works here, but again, it's a fold R uh, extending in all possible ways, extending. Um, so the, the things that have been generated are counts of the coins you've seen so far. You consider the coins from right to left because it's a fold R, so you consider the uh, highest value coin first. And at each step, you can take a value C, uh, account C of, of the next denomination of coin, uh, any number of coins from zero up to the residue div the value of that coin. Um, so we, we generate uh, handfuls of change that are less than or equal to N in all possible ways. We keep only the ones whose residue is zero, so keep only the ones that make up the actual sum we're looking for, um, and then compute the find one with the minimum cost. Um, so there's a well-known greedy algorithm for this. This is what you do in the shop, what uh, the checkout system will do in the shop. You start with the most uh, valuable coin, um, and you take as many of those as possible. And that works for most currencies. Um, in particular, it works for the UK currency. Uh, and it's a greedy algorithm. Um, but again, uh, our nice, pretty greedy calculation doesn't apply because the greedy condition doesn't hold. The program works, but the proof doesn't. And the proof doesn't, again, because the ordering on tuples, min with count, is not linear. You can have different tuples with the same count. So here's a, an example. Um, suppose my currencies, my denominations were one, three, and seven, and I wanted to make up 54. One way of doing it is with two pennies, one threepenny bit, and seven seven pence coins. Another way of doing it is with four three pence coins and six seven pence coins. Those both add up to 54. Those both have 10 coins. So each of those is as good as the other. Uh, the obvious algorithm, the greedy algorithm, picks as many sevens as it can. So it picks the left hand one. But as it happens, the program I've defined computes the right hand one. So they're different. So the implementation I was aiming for is not equal to the specification, the thing that says, um, in this case, so the, the implementation is the thing on the left, the obvious greedy algorithm, it doesn't define uh, what the specification said it should define. And that's not a problem if you're in a shop, you still get 10 coins, you get different 10 coins, they both add up to 54 pence, 54 units. Um, but uh, the explanation for why the greedy algorithm works fails here. Um, what can we do about it? Uh, Again, you can change the ordering. Um, so rather than minimizing count, you can maximize the reverse of the list. Um, so this, uh, again, this is an ordering on sequences. It's taking the lexically greatest in reverse order. So it's taking the one with most seven value coins. And then uh, if there's a tie on sevens, the one with most three value coins and so on. And for the coin changing problem, that happens to work. The greedy condition does now hold. Um, and if you follow the greedy development, then the obvious greedy algorithm comes out. Um, but it uh, doesn't work for all currencies. Uh, not all, and that's not a problem with my calculation. It's a problem with the greedy algorithm in general. The greedy algorithm doesn't always work, doesn't work for every currency. Uh, in particular, for the UK currency before we decimalized in 1971, um, it doesn't work, and I'll show that uh, later. Um, let me pause there and ask, look at questions about greedy arguments. There are a bunch. So uh, Simon Peyton Jones asks, the greedy condition is a condition on what? Um, 
it's a what's it a condition on? Um, it's a condition on the components of your problem. So uh, let me go back to the greedy condition. Uh, I've defined G step on the previous line to be something to do with minimum and extending. So this says, uh, take a candidate, extend it by component X in all possible ways and take the best of those. And the greedy condition says, if you have a bunch of candidate C's and you do that for each of the candidates in the bunch and take the best, uh, that's the same as taking the best uh, on the right hand side before extending and then just extending that one. So the, the greedy condition says, uh, you can look ahead, extend all possible ways um, and, and then take the best, but on the left-hand side, but the right-hand side, you don't need to do that. Um, you can just pick one, the best uh, of the things you've got so far and, and then extend that in the best way. And that's the essence of when the greedy algorithm works, when, you can, when it's safe to proceed with only a single candidate. Um, so this encapsulates the conditions under which the greedy algorithm works. Adam Tripala asks, how commonly do you find that a non-executable specification could be much cleaner than the one than the style used in this talk? That's an excellent question. Um, uh, sometimes you do, and I will show you some other examples in the next part of the talk. Well, I won't show you the example, but I'll, I'll hint at them. Uh, sometimes uh, you, you want to, uh, the best specification of a problem is, is the inverse of something else. Uh, and inverse isn't a, a, um, an executable piece of uh, code, so you can't write your program that way. Um, still, you can, uh, you can write an equation that says uh, these two things should be each other's inverses and then deduce stuff from that using equational reasoning. But uh, certainly there are problems where uh, specifying your problem in the first place as a, a clear, simple functional program is already uh, uh, a challenge and already perhaps um, uh, polluting your specification with parts of your intended solution. So that's, a, that's an important point. Simon PJ again asks, does candidates imply you use each component exactly once? Uh, uh, in this variant of the greedy problem, yes, I believe that's the case. So, uh, um, well, no, I, sometimes not exactly once. So some, some, some are less than once, uh, but not more than once. So for example, building minimum cost, cost spanning trees, you consider each edge in turn. If the edge doesn't make a cycle, you can add it to your tree so far and still have a tree. If the edge does make a cycle, then you should discard it. Um, uh, that's uh, one of the two minimum cost spanning tree algorithms. The other one, uh, uh, an edge might not be, if you're just growing a single tree, Prim's algorithm, um, uh, the, the edge might not be usable yet, in which case you have to put it aside and, and pick a different one. Uh, but then eventually you'll get to that edge and you might use it later or you might discard it later. But I think uh, we haven't considered anywhere components are used more than once. That doesn't fit within our problem description. Um, Alexander T asks, is it possible to make all these transformations done automatically with rewrite rules? Well, that's um, uh, very difficult in my, uh, in my estimation. Um, Lots of people have tried, uh, I've failed. I mean, I haven't really tried, but nothing I've seen convinces me. And so I do these calculations with pen and paper. Um, it would be nice to have a, an ergonomic proof assistant that uh, stopped me making mistakes with my pen and paper at least, and maybe even hinted at things that I could try. Uh, but I don't know of such a thing um, that is uh, compelling to me, more compelling than pen and paper. So I think there's definitely a, uh, an interesting research question there. Uh, Norman Ramsey asks, when patch the issues with inversion count, suddenly everything gets informal. Can you connect patches back to the calculation? Fix the greedy condition, changing, change everything. Um, I don't understand that one. Uh, Norman, Maybe you want to elaborate on that and come back in the next break and I'll move on now. 
So we managed to fix the sorting greedy algorithm and the coins greedy algorithm by refining the ordering uh, from a, an, a not anti-symmetric ordering to an anti-symmetric one, a linear one. But I say that's cheating. Um, I, so it's somewhat ad hoc. Um, it happened to work in those two cases, but it's not clear what the general case is. It's prejudicial. Uh, you having to think about which, um, which of the equally good results you want uh, and bake that into the specification. Um, so for coins, we, we, we really only cared about the number of coins. That wasn't good enough. So then you have to add extra criteria and um, uh, you're again, polluting the specification with some part of the solution. So I think that's, that's un, uh, unhelpful. But we needed it because we wanted the greedy condition to be satisfied. We needed the greedy condition to be satisfied. And that entails proving an equivalence um, that candidates C and C prime uh, are related on cost if and only if extending them in the best way gives you a relation on cost. And that's, that really holds in practice. So what often happens is that now C and C prime are as good as each other, but when they're extended, maybe um, differences between them become clear and uh, the best extension of C might be much better than the best extension of C prime. Uh, and so you don't get an equivalence um, in most cases. And in the examples we see, you don't get an equivalence. So what we want is, uh, all, all we need in principle is monotonicity, that um, uh, uh, an implication rather than an equivalence. Uh, but then the, the greedy condition is, is, um, isn't sufficient. So really the solution here is to, to move to relations. And this comes back to Adam's question about non-executable specifications. Um, some problems are best specified as the converse of some other function. So the, the, it might have a simple converse and you want to, to uh, derive a, a fancy um, uh, forward version. But for optimization problems, often typically there are multiple distinct minimal solutions and the specification you write should allow any of those optimal solutions to be returned. It shouldn't pre-commit to any one of them. Um, uh, but you write an implementation, the implementation is a deterministic program. So it by force uh, chooses one, um, it should be an optimal one, that's the specification, but there's no need for the implementation to be able to generate all optimal solutions, just, just some of them. So in essence, uh, the, the implementation must refine the specification. So you led uh, inexorably to a, a calculus of relations. And uh, so this was uh, Richard's previous attempt in, in the book, um, Algebra Programming um, with Richard, with um, de Moore. And I have to say, this is really the right way of doing it. Um, so here's the corresponding greedy theorem um, from the Algebra Programming book, page 173 of the Algebra Programming book, theorem 7.2. And I'm not going to talk through this. Uh, you'll note that it's got converses, the superscript circle. Uh, it's got inclusions. So there's refinement there. And you'll notice at the bottom of the slide, um, it's got a monotonicity condition. That's the, the essence of the monotonicity condition we had on the previous slide. Um, but it's written rather opaquely. And uh, all of these things in the algebra programming book are, I fear, written rather opaquely. Um, uh, it's very pretty, but it's pretty complicated. And uh, nobody, Nobody does this anymore. Not even Richard uh, or Ruka do this anymore. There are a few very brave uh, PhD students who've gone and studied this and extended it, and they don't do it anymore. Um, and uh, it's it's uh, it's perfectly the right thing, but it's uh, sort of idealistically the right thing, but it's too complicated to use. So we're going to do something a bit simpler. Um, it turns out that it suffices to extend. Uh, our development language very slightly. You don't need to go all the way to relations. Um, all you need is to extend it with one thing that's not no longer functional programming. Uh, here's min with with a capital N. So written with a capital N to indicate that it's not a Haskell function anymore. And one piece of notation is wiggly arrow. So read the wiggly arrow as is a possible result of. 
Uh, so the specification here says X is a possible result of min with F X's, if and only if X is in the list X's, so it's an element of the list X's. And uh, for every Y that's also in the list X's, F of X is less than or equal to F of Y. So X is a member of the list and it's as good as any other member of the list. Uh, the list should be non-empty, finite. Um, I'm only considering finite, non, non, uh, finite lists and no undefined lists or anything like that. Uh, I should say uh, one thing we need min with, there'll be a second thing that we need in the fourth part of the talk, but only those two things. So uh, for example, the distributive law that we had uh, in the greedy calculation now with this um, non-deterministic min with, so you should think of min with F as a non-deterministic function that yields any of the minimal values. Uh, this distributive law is an, is an equality. And what it means is X is a possible result of the left-hand side, if and only if X is a possible result of the right-hand side. So I seem to have changed the cost to F here. Um, but uh, so X is a possible result of the left-hand side, if and only if X is a possible result of the right-hand side, which in turn means um, there's some X's, uh, which is a possible result of math min with F X's, and X is a possible result of min with F X's. So uh, distributivity says uh, you can take your list of lists, can cap them together and pick a best in any, any of the best. Um, uh, that should be equivalent to, uh, that is equivalent to, you can prove it, um, uh, picking any of the bests of any of the lists and then any of those bests, which is the last line. I don't know if that gloss made it any easier to understand, but I think the, the, the uh, expression makes it easiest to understand. So I hasten to add, we only do this for specifications. You start off with specifications. You can use these non-deterministic functions in the specifications. But the name of the game is to uh, use fusion and refine um, and come up with something that's no longer non-deterministic. So you end up with a program that is deterministic and has none of these uh, extensions. In. Uh, so this, ex this approach is explored in uh, a paper by Richard and Florian Raba. Uh, at Math the Program Construction Conference last year, how to calculate the non-deterministic functions. And you can read the details uh, now there um, if, you can't, uh, if you can't wait for the book to come out. What do we need uh, in order to make this work? Well, we don't need very much. Um, and in fact, essentially the only thing we need for the greedy um, uh, calculations we've been looking at is to uh, generalize the fusion rule slightly so that we're fusing uh, the following function H that we're fusing is a non-deterministic function. So in our case, it's going to be one of these min widths with a capital M. Um, and the, uh, the fusion law says, uh, uh, starting off with fold RFE and then following that up with a non-deterministic aggregator H, um, a functional program that is a possible, that yields a possible result of that, fold R with F prime and E prime, um, you get that uh, possible result provided again, greedy conditions, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, promotion conditions apply as on the right hand side. Um, uh, so you don't want equalities, you don't um, need equalities on the right hand side, it suffices to have refinements on the right hand side. So uh, when you push H through F, um, it refines to uh, F prime with an H in the, in the second argument. So this is a, a, a generalization of the fusion we had before to these non-deterministic functions. And I'll spare you the details, but the greedy calculation uh, goes through before not needing equality anymore. So the greedy condition before was that uh, G step X after min with cost should equal min with cost after that G step X. Now it should only need only refine it. Um, and uh, again, the, the G step um, uh, is a functional thing. It's written with a lowercase letter. Uh, that should be some functional refinement of extending the current candidate by the next component X in all possible ways and picking the best. So um, it just has to pick any one of the best. And 
Now this works perfectly smoothly with the coin changing problem. We don't need to switch to a different um, cost function. Uh, the, the obvious cost function, cost being count, su uh, suffices. This greedy condition with refinement rather than equality holds and uh, the obvious greedy algorithm pops out uh, from the greedy specification. So the non-determinism works very smoothly uh, in this case. Um, so I'm going to pause again there for some more questions. That's the end of part three of the talk. Um, derive, uh, Adam Chapala asks, there been any interesting examples of deriving compilers in the relational version of things? Well, uh, good question. Um, I think the right person to answer that is, uh, is Graham Hutton. I don't know if he's, uh, if he's listening. Um, uh, of course, he's been deriving compilers recently and his uh, PhD thesis was on relational things. So he ought to know. Um, I'm not sure that I've seen that, but that will be a nice application area. Um, Artem Pelenitsin asks, for tools other than pen and paper, oh, that wasn't a question. Oh, um, Liquid Haskell. Yes, uh, so uh, I haven't yet dared to try these things in anger. So uh, um, I, I'm keen to be led. Anonymous, the greedy algorithm is optimal, optimal for certain coin systems. Does your technique give you a characterization of which coin systems? No, it doesn't. Um, excellent question. Uh, Turns out that the criteria under which the greedy algorithm works is uh, very obscure. And lots of people, lots of uh, combinatorics people have written papers on uh, when the greedy algorithm works. There are some nifty results, but it doesn't come out of our specification. Um, it just, uh, the specification says, uh, and really it says if the greedy algorithm works, then doing this will give you an algorithm that works. Um, but I've had a lot of fun over the last couple of days trying to answer that question, expecting that it would come up. Thank you for asking me. Simon Peyton Jones should not pre-commit to a particular output among the possible results, but why not? You didn't say, perhaps because it doesn't compose well. Um, uh, it's because pre-committing to a particular one is encoding in your specification which one you want. Um, and so that limits your possibilities for uh, coming up with an algorithm. Uh, you can say you want the, uh, uh, the, the, the greenest of all the minimal cost things um, and then do a calculation that leads indeed to the greenest one, but um, there might've been other perfectly good algorithms that you missed because they happen not to produce the greenest one. Um, so a specification should characterize the things that are important to you about the solution and no more, because that gives you the greatest scope. Um, uh, Nuth said premature optimization is the, uh, um, the source of all evil. Uh, so this is uh, premature uh, refinement of specifications is also uh, a source of evil. Phil Wadler asks, you specify the meaning of the wiggly arrow. What is the meaning of uh, map with uh, min width? So, um, well, I've glossed over the details, but they're all there in the book and they're all there in Richard and Florian's paper. And I don't have time to uh, give the definitions here. Um, but uh, uh, there's, a, there's a monotonicity law that says uh, expressions with non-deterministic parts, um, if you refine the non-deterministic part, then you refine the whole thing. So X is a possible result of the thing with the non-deterministic part if on one side, if the other side. Um, Julia Belyakova asks, there can be multiple working combinations of min with an extend for the same problem. If they are, which to prefer? Is a cheaper min width better? Uh, interesting question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, indeed, there are different ways of specifying the problem. Uh, they might lead you to the same program. They might lead you to different programs. Um, it's a matter of um, trying it and seeing what happens, I think. Um, I don't have a better answer than that, sorry. 
uh, Alexander Chichigin. Is it possible to implement min with, with algebraic effects and handles? Ooh. Uh, well, it's kind of uh, a non-determinism monad. Um, uh, and the next question looks like adding min with a wiggly arrow is nearly the same as working in the non-determinism monad, except for types. Um, so this is, uh, I think those two questions are, are related. And uh, indeed, another way of doing all this would be to put a non-determinism monad in there and do everything with monads. Um, and then you have to lift everything to be a monadic program. And we, we thought about it. And I have to say that was my first uh, thought about how this should be done. And Richard persuaded me that uh, uh, there's a lot to be gained from glossing over that. And uh, the small number of rules are all you need. And as long as you stick to the rules, um, uh, everything is sound. And that's what Florian and Richard's paper shows. And uh, the, the types clutter things and the extra monadic combinators having to use binds and do notation and stuff like that rather than plain simple functional programming. They, they're, all, they're all correct, but they're all a bit pedantic and uh, they make the calculations less appealing. So we've tried to take as light a touch as possible in the book. And uh, so we've avoided that. Uh, so that's the th next question as well. Lyle Kopnitsky, can we implement non-determinism using the list monad? Yes, you could do all this with the list monad. Uh, Hossein Hayeri, is it a valid assumption that functional programming will always bring you the most readable implementation? Well, I guess not. Uh, there are some programs that are perhaps best written imperatively. Um, we avoid them. Uh, uh, this is a tool. Um, it's useful for things. It's useful for lots of things. I don't claim that it's useful for everything. Um, and it's important to know your tools and know what they're useful for. Uh, Fidel asks for clarification, fx, f prime x, h of y is a single element or several possible? Well, it's an expression uh, and it's a non-deterministic one because it has a capital H in it. So it, uh, it's not a single element. It's, uh, if you were doing this with monads, this would be something of monadic type, it's a computation. And Fidel also asks, do you know the relation between greedy algorithms and matroids? Can the conditions be related? Well, uh, I do know of that connection. Um, in fact, there's another thing called greedoids, which are a generalization of matroids. And there's a very nice book by um, Korte and Lovac, two Hungarian mathematicians. It's a Springer book from about 1990, came out while I was doing my PhD. Uh, and I might have done my PhD on this. Um, they write mathematical structure for greedy algorithms is not matroids, that's too specific, but greedoids is your thing. And if you're keen, uh, I recommend the book to you because if it almost tempted me out of my actual PhD topic into a different one. Right, let me move on to the fourth part. Um, so the greedy algorithm works when it works by maintaining only a single candidate. Uh, and it's very nice when it does, it's a very simple program when it does. Um, the alternative might, might seem that you have to consider all possible candidates, but there's a sweetly reasonable spot in between uh, where you maintain only some of the possible candidates. Some candidates uh, dominate others, and then you can discard the ones that are being dominated, some partial candidates. So you don't need to maintain them all, you can maintain only a subset of them. And we call this thinning. Um, and it's, it's not something that's traditionally seen as part of algorithm design. It's not something that's in any other algorithm design textbook, as far as I know. It's, uh, it's kind of there, essentially, in operations research um, uh, materials. Uh, so so uh, Cesar Ionescu was, uh, was explaining this to me last week. Um, but they don't study it as a, I believe they don't study it as a design algorithm design technique in itself. So the second novelty in the book, apart from non-determinism, this light touch to non-determinism is uh, the emphasis on thinning algorithms. Uh, 
So the things that we use thinning for are often presented in algorithm design courses using dynamic programming. Thinning can lead to a more effective solution. It can, it can lead to a neater and more obvious development. And we think it's better to think of dynamic programming as taking a divide and conquer program and then memorizing it. Um, and it's, it's not really about the, uh, the, the dominating of one candidate by, by others. So uh, here's an example, paths in a layered network. So you've got a directed acyclic graph in layers. So the, the, uh, the vertices are, there's a first layer and a second layer and a, a last layer. Weights on the edges and the, the problem is to find the shortest path from top to bottom. So in this example, the shortest path goes from D to G to K to P. It's a directed acyclic graph. Um, so you can use Dijkstra's algorithm at least as long as the weights are non-negative, but that takes order N squared steps where N is the number of vertices and we can do better than that. Uh, the greedy algorithm doesn't work. Um, so if you were to pursue the greedy algorithm from the top, you consider the best edge from the top layer and that would be the, the edge from B to F, which has weight one, uh, and that won't lead you to the best overall. However, um, from a given uh, source vertex, well, I should say the greedy algorithm also doesn't work from the bottom. So if you consider it from the bottom, you'll find the edge from J to N of cost two, and that also doesn't lead you to a, a best path. But um, from a given uh, vertex anywhere in the graph, the path to the, the optimal path to the bottom layer, uh, to the bottom of the graph, um, you only need to keep the, the best out of those. There's no virtue in keeping two paths from a given vertex to the bottom of different weights. A shorter path dominates along the path from a given vertex. So you don't need uh, to keep any more than one path from each vertex as you're considering the vertices. So to capture this, uh, we introduce one other non-deterministic function, thin by, um, and you give it a pre-order here written with a curly less than or equal to. Um, uh, let me call that improves. And uh, it takes a collection of elements and produces another collection of elements. Um, and the Ys is a possible result of thinning by some improvement function on Xs. If Ys is a subsequence of Xs, so you get Ys by deleting some elements of Xs. And every X in Xs is uh, improved by some Y in Ys. So the, the things that you end up with cover in some sense what was there to start with. So computing the shortest thing uh, takes quadratic time. Um, uh, Richard and I have just written a paper about that and submitted it for review. Uh, so you can read that. Um, it was going to be an exercise in the book that turned out to be too long to be an exercise. Uh, and quadratic time is too expensive to be uh, an intermediate step in an efficient algorithm. We want a linear time function um, so we're not going to insist on computing the shortest thing. We're just going to compute some thing. We're going to discard some elements and maybe not as aggressively as we could have done. So here's a function thin by with a little t. It is a function. It's no longer non-deterministic. Um, and it just considers adjacent elements. Uh, so when you, you it, it goes through the list consing as it goes, but when it conses an element onto the front of a list, uh, x, an, an element x onto a list starting with y, if X improves Y or Y improves X, you discard one, otherwise you keep both of them. And this is still useful um, if the candidates can be generated in the right order. Uh, so we can do some calculation with thin by. Uh, I'm not gonna go through these laws, but there are, there are a handful of them, six of them here. The important ones are the first one that says you can introduce some thinning provided that uh, the things you chuck away by thinning are going to get chucked away by cost anyway. And the other important one is the distributivity law, the third one there, which is like we, what we had for min and concat. This is thin and concat. Um, so here's the uh, layered network problem. And again, I'm not going to go through this, but note that the minimum cost path is uh, some functional refinement of 
min with cost after paths. So there's that min with cost again with a capital M and the paths is a fold R. Uh, again, uh, I'll skip over the details. Um, the thin introduction law, the first of those six laws I showed you says uh, min with cost can be re refined to min with cost after thin by some improvement relation, provided that the improvement relation doesn't throw away anything it shouldn't. So the improvement relation we're going to pick is that one path P improves another path Q. These, as it happens, are going to be non-empty paths. Uh, so one path P improves another path Q if they have the same source vertex. So remember, uh, we're only going to consider domination between paths on, from the same source vertex and the cost of P is uh, less than or equal to the cost of Q. So that thin step is, uh, refines the specification. Um, and now the challenge is to fuse the thinning and the path generation. And again, fusion works, paths is a fold R. So we can fuse the thin by into the step function for paths and get a thinning step function, T step, provided we can satisfy this uh, fusion condition. And there's a calculation that demonstrates that. Um, uh, so there's unpacking the definition of step using the distrib distributivity law of thin by one piece of work for which you'll have to read the book. Um, and then folding the definition of step again. And that leads to uh, leads you to a definition of T-step and provided that, given that definition, um, uh, you end up with a, uh, the, the fusion condition holding. Uh, Non-deterministic fusion. So the, the thing at the top is not equal to the thing at the bottom, but refines to the thing at the bottom. And that gives you a program. Uh, so we've fused the thinning with the generation and we get a single fold R with this T-step function. And uh, so min with is some functional refinement of min with a capital M and thin by is some functional refinement of thin by with a capital T. Any refinement will do. And uh, you get a, a program. And now you can improve this program by tuppling paths with their costs so you don't have to keep recomputing the cost of a path. You can improve this program by sorting the layers of a network uh, and then making sure you generate the candidates in the same order. Uh, so that you can do thinning by merging two sorted lists, and then you'll keep at most one path per vertex. So then if you have a, uh, a layered uh, network with D layers of K vertices, this takes D cubed K time and Dijkstra's algorithm takes N squared, so D squared K squared time. So this is better when the network is deeper than it is wide. And if you allow yourself to use uh, arrays, uh, updatable arrays um, of size k, uh, then it comes down, uh, that removes a factor of, of d. Uh, so maybe updatable arrays, updatable arrays of size k, I think. Uh, so it, it comes faster still. So it's just a fold up from the bottom. Uh, you keep for each uh, vertex in the current layer the best path from that vertex to the end. Uh, you keep all those candidates, and then when you've finished, you, you take the best. Uh, the best start vertex. So that seems very natural. Um, you can do the same for a coin changing problem. Uh, so the, as I said, the greedy algorithm doesn't work for all currencies. And in particular, it doesn't work for UK pre-decimal currency. Here we had this before 1971, this wacky currency with um, halfpennies and pennies and threepenny bits. And the odd thing is there was a, a florin, 24 old pence, and then a half crown, which is 30 old pence. And then if you try to make 48 pence, old pence in this, uh, using the greedy algorithm, you'll take the, the half crown and then have to take the shilling, 12 old pence and the sixpence to make 48. And that's three coins. Whereas of course, two florins would give you the same value with only two coins. Um, so thinning works. Uh, we're going to keep partial candidates consisting again of the counts of the coins we've seen so far in the residue. And we're going to try to minimize uh, the pairs, R comma count Cs. So we're going to 
end up, the best one will be one with res residue zero, and of those, um, uh, the one with smallest count is going to be best. And we're going to thin by the improvement ordering. Uh, it has to not discard things too aggressively. So uh, in, in our case, we're only going to thin when two uh, partial candidates have the same residue and then uh, um, compare the counts. So given two candidates of the same residue, one with a smaller count dominates, one with a larger count. There's no virtue in having two candidates of the same residue. So the greedy algorithm works for all currencies, not necessarily uh, sensible ones. Yeah, these are sometimes called disorderly currencies and UK predecessor currency was disorderly in that sense. So you can also express coin thinning problem as a layered network problem. And you can also, it's, um, it's a common example for dynamic programming, but I think thinning explains better what's going on here. Um, and uh, I think that's um, all I have to say. Um, my, I'm conscious that I've run a bit over time. I have uh, explained why functional programming is useful for algorithm design and showed you some examples and introduced the two novelties in the book. Um, non-determinism as a linguistic novelty and thinning as an algorithmic novelty. And if you want more, then it's, um, it's all in the book uh, and it's available from all good bookshops soon, apparently, um, uh, next month, perhaps. Uh, I'm lucky to have my copy now. So uh, I'll stop there for questions. There's one more on Slido, anonymous. Thinning appears to be a list version of branch and bound, where branch and bound can be seen as tree based. Is this reasonable? Um, I hadn't thought about it. I am. Uh, I can't answer that on the spot. Um, that's worth considering. Uh, I'll. You'll have to ask me in a week's time and see if I've uh, come up with an answer to that. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I think it's time to end the, the main part of the talk here. We'd like to try an experiment. Um, people have asked us about a little bit of socializing at the end of these talks. So we're going to post the Zoom link from which Jeremy has been streaming into the YouTube chat. And so anybody who would like to drop in and say hello to Jeremy or ask another question, please feel free to do so. This is an experiment. If, if it goes terribly wrong, we will just stop. So uh, we, we look forward to seeing some of you at least in the YouTube meeting soon. Let's give Jeremy a round of applause. Thank you, thank you.